In what is probably the vast majority of cases involving murders, the guilty person is captured and brought to justice. This, of course, does not bring back the life that they stole, but it also allows the family of the victim to have a sense of closure. But what about those that actually managed to get away with murder? The following stories tell the tale of three incredibly evil people who got away with murder and never admitted to what they did until they were about to die. One victim was just a child for no reason, and another had been a long abuser before becoming a victim themselves. Still, others were simply for being in the wrong place at the wrong time. It was the evening of August 5th, 1989, and 14-year-old Gina Brooks of Fredericktown, Missouri, was enjoying the summer day by watching her brother's baseball game. She was a beautiful, blonde-haired, green-eyed teenager with her whole life ahead of her. After the game ended, she would return home for a little while before later deciding she was going to visit her boyfriend. He only lived six blocks away. That evening, Gina had already told her mother, Sydney, goodnight, and Cindy had gone to bed. She told her brother she was going out before she left on her bike at around 10 p.m. that night. Many hours passed by and eventually it was 2 a.m. Cindy happened to wake up in the night and decided to go check Gina's room, only to find it empty. It was then that she realized Gina still hadn't come home. Her mother was understandably frantic and called the police to report her daughter missing. Police began combing through the town searching for any signs of her. Eventually they found her bicycle, which was abandoned on the side of the road, about five blocks from her house. But, but she, she was, was nowhere, nowhere around. around. Police also began questioning local neighbors to try to determine where Gina was last seen. They eventually find out that Gina was last seen nearby a local church. She had been seen standing near her bicycle when three men in a blue Blue station wagon pulled up alongside her. They had, they been, had been following, following her. her. When they got out of the car to try to talk to her, she must have realized she was in danger because she hopped off her bike and took off. While it wasn't clear to those who witnessed this exactly what happened, some people, including Gina's boyfriend, heard screams and watched as the station wagon took off at a high pace towards the highway. The whole town came out to search day and night for missing Gina, and her family were desperate to bring her back home. They hung up posters, searched local caves and woods, but sadly were never able to find even a trace of the young girl who was set to start eighth grade not long after she disappeared. The entire town, which was very small with only around 4,000 residents, was terrified and traumatized by the this great loss. Year after year passed, and it appeared that this was going to be a cold case and that Gina's loved ones would never actually know what happened to her. But was this, was really, this really the end, the end of the end story? story? Everything completely changed in September of 1996. There was a patient at St. Louis, Missouri Hospital who was in the process of dying. He had not only had cancer, but was suffering from complications from AIDS. He knew that his days were numbered. This patient was a man named Brian Squires. In his very final days, he admitted to some of the nurses that he had information about not only one, but three brutal unsolved murders. He was behind the slaying of nine-year-old Angie Hausman, who disappeared in November of 1993. Angie was from St. Anne, a suburb of St. Louis. With the help of another man, Bryant kidnapped her right after she got off the school bus. Her brutally beaten body was found tied to a tree just nine days after she was missing. She had been horrifically and left for dead. She eventually died of sun exposure, among other wounds. Bryant did not reveal who his accomplice was for this crime. Bryant did reveal that a man named Nathan Williams had been behind the other murders, though. He said in 1975, Williams, who was only 14 at the time, had killed a 23-year-old woman named Laura Dinwiddie. Laura was a good person who worked as a volunteer with inner city children and taught them sign language. Her naked dead body was found in her apartment. She had not only been but her throat was brutally Finally, Bryant revealed what actually happened to Gina that tragic night that would change her loved ones' lives forever. On the night of Gina's disappearance, he had been one of the three men in the station wagon that confronted the team. In fact, he had been behind the wheel. He claimed that the other two men with him were Nathan Williams and Timothy Bellow. While working together, the men kidnapped Gina, her throat, and then disposed of her body. Not long after making these horrific confessions, Bryant would die. 
He would never have to pay for the horrible crimes that he committed. But what about Nathan and Timothy, who were still alive? Both of these men were arrested in 1999 in connection to Gina's murder. Timothy was hardly a first-time offender and had been in trouble with the law many times in the past, most commonly in connection with taking advantage of women. When questioned by police, Timothy didn't deny being connected to Gina's murder. He even described the supposed location of her body, which was, which a, was freezer a freezer on his, on his father's, father's vast 96-acre property. property. But while this area was searched thoroughly, police were never able to find Gina's remains. Tragically, Timothy's charges in connection to Gina's death would ultimately be dropped in 1999, and he would later be charged with lying to the FBI. The sentence he ended up receiving was only a measly 30 months behind bars, which is about two and a half years. As if this wasn't already unfortunate enough, the charges against Nathan Williams in connection to Gina's case were also dropped. Law enforcement simply didn't believe that Bryant's deathbed confessions were the whole truth and that Nathan could have been responsible for two different slayings. In fact, they even claimed that because Bryant had confessed to his nurses and not the police, his confessions were no longer valid. Additionally, the nurses hadn't come to the police to tell them about the confessions initially because they did not believe Bryant was actually of stable mind and telling the truth. However, Nathan would still have to pay for the other crimes he had been connected with, including having taken physical advantage of a little girl just a month after Gina's disappearance. He was also considered to be the person behind the disappearance of a 12-year-old girl named Tammy Sertum. Tammy of St. Charles, Missouri disappeared during the beginning of August of 1975. Because Tammy was always running away from home, her family didn't report her as missing right away. But after she did not return home for a long period of time, her parents finally realized she had been the victim of foul play and notified the authorities. Nathan would later admit to not only kidnapping and taking advantage of young Tammy's body, but also to her to death and burying her body. Her remains were never discovered. Despite the evidence against him, Nathan has shockingly never actually been convicted of any murder. He did, however, get a sentence to a minimum of 30 years in prison in connection to his other charges. He is currently in prison at Jefferson County Correctional Center in Missouri. Geraldine Kelly, who went by Jerry, was quite simply not the average woman you would come across in the early 1990s. She was quite small and dark haired, but she was also covered in tattoos, kept attack dogs as pets, and would even sometimes be spotted wearing an enormous boa constrictor around her neck. She was clearly not the type of person to be messed with, but what from her history would make her this way? Geraldine met her future husband, John Kelly, when they were both children. They went on to get married and later had two children, a daughter and a son. While things in their marriage may have started out okay, they took a turn for the worse in 1981, during a wedding one fateful evening. John had been drinking too much and ended up getting into a fight with some of the other wedding guests. While it's not clear exactly how it happened, the fight resulted in the death of his brother-in-law. John was terrified that he could be charged with murder, so he decided to pack up his family and move across the country. They settled in California where he would land a job working at a motel. But during this time, he was still drinking heavily and he and Geraldine would fight all the time, eventually causing their two children to move away and distance themselves from them. John was allegedly very abusive towards Geraldine for many years, causing her to become cold-hearted towards him. Eventually, the abuse became too much for her to bear and she decided to take revenge upon her husband. She shot him dead and then placed his body in a freezer where it remained for more than six years. Of course, no one, including law enforcement or Jerry's own family, was at all aware of what she had done to John for many years. She told her children that their dad had simply died in a car and they had no reason to doubt this story. After all, why would she lie to them? It wasn't until around six years later that Jerry, now dying from breast cancer, would decide to come clean about what she had done. She told her daughter about the details of her husband's murder and her daughter would soon after notify the proper authorities. Police went to go check the freezer, Jerry had described, and sure enough, they discovered the remains of her former husband. While he was found quite severely decomposed, his body was soon identified due to his very specific tattoos. By this point, Jerry had already passed, and it was already too late for her to serve justice for her husband's murder.
It was the year 1975, and 20-year-old Michael Mansfield was a student studying at Lincoln College. He was a hardworking student, but was unfortunately in a little bit of trouble with the law. He had been caught in the fall carrying stolen goods. The stolen items were record albums that he had been caught trying to dispose of in his dormitory. The district attorney decided to have mercy on him and cut him a deal. He said that he would drop all charges against him if he only turned in the person who sold him the goods. Michael agreed and would ultimately turn in 21-year-old Russell Smraker, which he knew would earn him his own freedom when he testified against him. That Christmas, Michael decided to return home to Rolling Meadow, Illinois. He spent the holiday with his parents and everything started out normal, but on the evening of New Year's Eve, he would leave home, only to never be seen again. He was gone without a trace, and police had nothing to go off of. As time went on, it would eventually become a cold case. The following year, there would be another strange occurrence, but this time it was back in the city of Lincoln, Illinois, where Michael had been attending school. It was the morning of June 2nd and 51-year-old Lincoln resident, Ruth Martin, hadn't arrived at work and hadn't called to tell anybody she wouldn't be coming in. This was very unlike her. Her coworkers were afraid for her well-being, so they ended up calling her husband, Richard. Richard was already at work, but he quickly rushed home to check on his wife. It was there, in their own garage, that he discovered not only a bullet, but a stain. He searched the home from top to bottom, but there was no sign of his wife. Just like in the case of Michael, there were no signs pointing towards any particular suspect, and police had little to go off of. They did end up finding Ruth's car abandoned in a nearby city with additional in the trunk. Not long after, yet another tragedy would strike the city of Lincoln, which was already reeling from all the recent crime. It was October 9th, just a few months since Ruth's disappearance, and police received a 911 call. Gunshots had been heard ringing out in what was usually a quiet, peaceful neighborhood. They were called to the home of Jay and Robin Fry, who were both just 25 years old. They had both been down and at the time, Robin had sadly been pregnant with the couple's first child. Police, who now had tons of pressure to figure out who had committed these crimes, were trying to find a possible motive and a possible connection between Ruth Martin's murder and that of the Fry's. All of these individuals were well-liked and didn't have any known enemies, but eventually they would come to realize that both Jay Fry and Ruth Martin had an unusual connection that you, that you certainly, certainly won't be, be expecting. expecting. Both Jay and Ruth were expected to testify against Russell Smirkar. It all started with a petty incident at a grocery store where Jay worked. Jay had caught Russell stealing and ended up chasing him through the store and into the parking lot. In an effort to get rid of any evidence, Russell would end up throwing the stolen items into Ruth Martin's car. It was a package of steaks that cost no more than $4. Both Jay and Ruth were expected to testify against Russell for the incident, but they never got the chance to because he would take their lives, along with the life of Robin, who was simply in the wrong place at the wrong time. But what happened to Michael Mansfield, who was still missing? Police would eventually discover that Michael had also been expected to testify against Russell, but for a very different reason. He had disappeared before he ever got the chance. They now had a very clear suspect for all three of these crimes. Russell was soon after arrested and later convicted in connection to the murders. He was sentenced to two life sentences in prison. Throughout the years, investigators would try many times to get him to open up about how exactly these slangs occurred, but he refused. It wasn't until he was dying at 56 years old in 2011, that from his deathbed, he finally confessed to the murders. While he couldn't or wouldn't answer where Michael Mansfield's body was, he did say Ruth Martin's body was buried under a highway that was under construction. Sadly, police were never able to find her body or Michael's remains. Russell would die soon after his confessions.